Thank you for these generous introductions. Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, Mr. President, dear colleagues and friends, it's not only a moving experience for me to be here, it's a great privilege, a great honor, and I would like to tell how grateful I am to all my hosts here in this School of Drama, in the university, and in the, in the city. Uh, what I'm going to, to say was written, I must uh, confess it, for a specific occasion. Uh, a, a few months ago, there was in New York, in the Museum of Modern Art, the nickname of it is MoMA, a great, the first great exhibition of uh, paintings and drawings by Anton Artaud on the occasion of the uh, Artaud's centenary. So I was asked to open the exhibition with a lecture and I try to refer uh, my remarks to the question of the museum, of the legitimacy of such an exhibition in a well-known uh, and worldwide, worldwide uh, uh, museum. So uh, that's the, 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 the framework of these remarks, but of course, although they are tied to the occasion, to this occasion and to the place where it was first delivered, I hope it will cross these uh, uh, boundaries. So let me start now, after having thanked all of you and Mr. Bajaj and Mrs. Rishinanda. I will start with a, a question, which is a quote from the very first uh, uh, picture we are going to see. Et qui aujourd'hui dira quoi? And who today will say what? And who today will say what? What a question. You see it thrust its letters, d'un coup, with a blow, into a drawing. It asks no determined question. D'un trait, with one stroke, it draws back. It awaits no word in answer from the drawing. It inscribes itself, in fact, in its fashion, in, in, and it is the fashioning or factor of this fair, this doing, that interests me here. It inscribes itself, in fact, in its fashion, in a graphic work, in the putting into space of visible bodies, forms, and lines, one word under the other, so, could we see the first slide? Here it is. You see, uh, et qui aujourd'hui dira quoi? It's written just here. And who today will say what? It's not a theoretical question, but a coup in French, I would say a, a blow struck or a stroke, specifically a stroke of the pencil that took place the day of today when it was struck as one strikes a blow on the paper only once, one unique time, unique time. And who today will say what? This mimed question of a blow at one blow is not, however, they call in, in English a rhetorical question. I'm pretending to install here today on the threshold of the exhibition which took place at the MoMA, uh, uh, to install here this question. Here it is in a museum called MoMA. Here it is once again, after the fact, après coup, one more time, in the imminence of that which has just hardly begun. And who today will say what? Et qui aujourd'hui dira quoi? Today, in an instant, someone is going to sign, asking himself and who today will say what? Today was or is July the 2nd, 1947. For a long time, almost a half century, these words will have set out their graphic body in a unique space. Their superposed handwritten letters had already been planted near a skull crowned in blue, and their lines had been aligned, spread out, stacked in color, like musical notes 
at different heights on the surface of a certain support. I'm citing these chromatic notations as a reminder. They date a certain day, they date from this day on which they took pl place at one blow. What is this lost question mark doing in the indecisive decision of the author on the border between two colors? It seems to suspend what is a question in form alone, a mute sentence that attempts through color to give us to hear that it certainly wants to say nothing yet, neither who nor what. A thing, because it is also a thing, does not know what it wants to say, neither who nor what. But although it says nothing, this phrase thing, this sentence thing, acts. Thing, act, and art, it does something. Elle fait quelque chose with words. In what fashion does it do what it does? De quelle façon fait-elle ce qu'elle fait? This fashion, this facture, is what we're going to call its coup. Blow, the event of a coup, the taking place of its coup, of its stroke, of a blow. What is a coup? And what does the facture of this act do with a museum? What does it do to a museum of modern art, a MoMA? This little piece of graphic art a half-lost inscription in the corner of a portrait in pencil and pastel. A cluster of words hung on the blue crown that covers the air of Jeannie de Ruy. This is the, 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 the model. And who today will say what? This question mark is inscribed, I said, July, July the 2nd, 1947. The date is readable. There where it seems to form the pedestal just down, the pedestal of, this, uh, of the signature. Antoine Artaud, July 2nd, 1947. I will not overload its meaning and its necessity. It is not impossible that for a brief moment, before or after the drawing, Artaud searched for words. He would then have decided to leave here the ironic trace of a signature, forever suspended on the edge of a work whose subject and object remain also to be interpreted, and who today will say what. A signature on the edge of the work, but in it, and along the upper edge this time, as if Arto had wanted to invert the tradition of certain medieval emblems. The latter, as you know, often bore at the bottom of the image, near the lower edge, a text, a legend, what was called a Subscription, subscription. Who will ever say why today I had to begin by letting you hear the spectral voice of Arto? In fact, in the, in the, uh, I know you have listened here to Arto's voice in the, in uh, previously in the conference, and I, I must confess I, I, I had to be in Bombay then, and I apologize and I, uh, for having missed the rest of the of the, of the conference. So uh, in the MoMA in New York, before starting to speak, I uh, let the audience hear Hato's voice, which is now recorded, uh, and we have uh, an extraordinary record of, of Hato's voice. Uh, a dumbfounded speech, both reproduced and alive, animal and superhuman, crying out, pierce, piercing, piercing, cruel, older than we are, so much more archaic, but also younger with the future that it announces. Let us not confuse this future with the New York triumph of a glorious autumn, ascension or assumption of a Western autumn that, quite rightly, would have stunned, worried, or outraged Arthur's friends and allies a few decades ago, not to speak of the revenant Antonin Arthur himself who often presented himself as a ghost or a, a revenant, a specter, and not only in what he called the return of Arto de Momo. In his interjections, 
he greeted what he called, I quote, the electrical discharge of the child revenant. While on the facing page, he feigned to sign in these terms, I quote again, well, it is I, Antonin Artaud, who has said all this, and it is what I want because Satan, that's me. Satan, c'est moi. During that year, and especially around the month of July 1947, Artaud drew more and more portraits and wrote several great texts on the face. On the face, that is, understand by that, on the subject of the so-called human face and even right on the faces he drew in color, à même les visages that he drew in, in color. I believe I believed I had to decide at least to begin in this way with the aim of dating right here, that is, of signing the event of the right here and of recalling an injunction. If we want to listen to him, then we have to obey Arto the Momo. We have to obey the order, the demand, or the imprecation an imprecation, as its name as its name indicates, an imprecation, imprecation is also a prayer. We have to obey the order, the demand, the imprecation that carry Arto's last signature, which is to say, on the work, on art, and on the body of the one who called himself one day, and then forever after, Arto le Momo. Sometimes the article, the Le Momo. The article was effaced by the hyphen, and the, cop and the couple or the pair copulated until they were, there was only one, a fan, that's what I mean, a fan, Arto Momo, Arto Momo. And sometimes even the hyphen disappeared. The voice that nicknamed in itself Arto Momo enjoins us to demand the singularity of the event namely the coup, the chance, the chance coup, but also the indivisible coup, indivisible coup. It enjoys us to rebel against reproductive representation, whatever the cost. To be sure, by the reproduction, again, of a doubled coup, a repercussion, but against reproduction, against technical reproduction, against genetic or genealogical reproduction. It, it joins us to reaffirm the singularity of the coup. So what does the word coup mean in French? And what happens to a question when it is done in one blow, d'un coup, when it is made into a blow, when it, it, when it strikes the blow? What would this have to do today with a museum? with an exhibition in a museum such as MoMA. So as to give oneself to the force of this blow, one must cruelly expose, I mean exhibit the exhibition. To reaffirm singularly is sometimes the fortunate chance offered by a museum, the chance of a hospitality to which one must give thanks since a museum exhibits original works and in principle banishes reproduction. Gratitude then to MoMA does not prohibit us, however, from posing a question here, but a question always lightning struck, I would say, lightning struck, that is foudroyé, foudroyé by Arto Momo. It is the serious and inexhaustible question of the museum here today, that I repeat today. I say foudroyé, Foudroyer, lightning struck. So as to salute what I see as the very figure of a phenomenal apparition, the event named Antonin Artaud, his meteoric existence, his passage in a flash across literature, poetry, theater, and the arts we call visual, his apparition as luminous, dangerous, mortal, exceptional lightning, as well as his thunderbolt, his coup de tonnerre in our history's skies, in a history of the art whose concept 
he will have sought to attack and virtually destroy. And one may say this even if, like me, one does not always approve of the philosophical or political content, the ideological themes at which, in spite of everything, this lightning man stops. In particular, I resist, I must say, everything in this work that in the name of the proper body or the body without organs, in the name of a reappropriation of self, is consonant with uh, an ecological naturalist protest, with the contestation of techniques, reproductions, prosthesis, parasite, succubim, supports, specters even, and artificial inseminations. In short, everything that is improper and that Arthur Momo identifies rapidly with America in 1947 in his text, uh, and that's the, the, the record we have of his voice uttering, delivering this text, pour en finir avec le jugement de Dieu, to have done with the judgment of God, in which he condemns uh, America for having uh, uh, performed artificial insemination at the time. I must admit that unlike almost all, all, all those with whom I share, I share a passionate admiration for Arto, I'm also bound to him by a sort of reasoned uh, detestation that the resistant but essential antipathy that is aroused in me by the declared content, the body of doctrine, assuming one can ever dissociate it from the rest, of that which might be called, thanks to a certain misunderstanding, the philosophy, politics, or ideology of Arthur. This would deserve a long explanation, but I, I will skip it. This antipathy resists, but it remains an alliance. It commands a vigilance of thinking, and I dare do hope, hope that the specter of Arthur would not disavow it. And before accusing Antonin Arthur of this metaphysical rage for reappropriation, one must lay blame on a machination, on the social, medical, psychiatric, judicial, ideological machine, on the machine of the police, which is to say, on a philosophical, political network that allied itself with more obscure forces so as to reduce this living lightning to a body that was bruised, tortured, rent, drugged, and above all, electrocuted by nameless suffering, an unnameable passion to which no other resource remained than to rename, to rename and reinvent language, which was done and signed Arthur, Arthur de Momo, during the last 10 years of his life, no doubt the most terrible years, the most wounded and the most creative. This glossolalic or glossopoetic rebirth of the language is not divorced in his project from the graphic lightning that burns all the drawings and portraits that were shown in this exhibition. The fiery blows, the flashes of this lightning, lit up everything with an incomparable lucidity to the point of inflaming the edges and the center the system of limits and the expropriating machine whose victim he was. This system uh, and this machine, this machine de lettre, machine of being, to cite the title of a work exhibited here in the museum and whose literality one should analyze, trade by trade, word for word, or syllable by syllable. This is the machine de lettre, machine of being. The system and this machine articulate together in the same body, in the same spectral figure, the Christian West, the God who steals my body, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Family, all the forces, ideological, political, economic, that are one with this thief of bodies, with the literature, theater, and art that descend from them with the archive and the hierarchy 
the sacralizing and poisoned higher archive of this accumulated culture between Europe and the American colonization. The museographic institution would be one of the great bewitched incarnations of this evil, something like the Western pyramid of this higher archive. Arto himself named this lightning passage, this flash of electricity in his drawing. And he did so precisely through the insulting imprecations he casts, like so many blasphemies, against the god of the Holy Family. In the sort of vade mecum that accompanies the drawing titled, and unfortunately I don't have the slide for this single drawing, that's the only drawing I'm going to, to, to speak of without having the slide. It's, it's in the book here, but I don't have the slide. Entitled La uh, Maladresse Sexuelle de Dieu, the sexual maladroitness or awkwardness of God. Um, in this drawing, he explains his own apparent and feigned maladroitness, awkwardness. These vade mecum which is also a vade retro satanas, recalls the electricity of lightning. It pretends to propose to electroshock God, in turn, by the very act of the drawing, more precisely by causing to pass through him a new electricity that will recharge the worn out batteries of the Trinity. Let me quote a translation. The tomb of everything wedding while God fools around with the instruments at the level of his belly that he hasn't known how to use, themselves maladroitly drawn so that the eye looking at them falls. And then you have this glosso poetics, glosso lali, that I, I'm going to try and read in my own insufficient fashion. Yo kutema tonu tadiktra, yo kute dekta anu tedri. It is my work that has made you electric, say I to God, when you always took yourself to be a battery that will no, not be worth to the, ba the battery with which I'm going to do you nicky knack, dont je vais te colificher. With which I'm going to nick knack you, you rascally old enterocolitic, dont je vais te colificher, bougre de vieille enterocolité. Later, the drawing electrocutes once again the Holy Family, after another glossopoetic interjection. Two more blows, two rifles, fusil, fusil, two rifle shots, coup de fusil, and two charcoal, charcoal strokes, de coup de fusil, coup de coup de fusil, de coup de fusil. Explode there, they cause, they cause history to explode, the brilliant lustre of he, what he calls the illustrious history of belief in God. One must realize that the blow struck is always the percussion of an electrocussion. To strike a blow, le coup fait rire, porter le coup, is not only to electroshock, but also to light up with fire, to take into view and to cause one to see the electroshock, to draw its picture as if on an operating table or a table used for torture, I quote. For it is thus that with the four irons of the open incest table of sex, the soul who wanted to lie with his father, to sleep astride as one horses around the virgin phallus, rifle, uh, rifle root, of the electric night, fusil racine de la nuit électrique, rifle root of the electric night, rifle to pierce, fusil to, pe to pierce through the illustratory misery, the illustrious history of belief in God. When I am the one who does it, pronounces the soul. When I ejaculate this yellow bellied fart. And I say to my soul, is me, and I say that my soul is me, and if it, if it pleases me to do a girl who one day wants to lie down on me, do, 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 and pee pee on me, I will do her in the face of and against God, 
the spirit of shitty retention who is always farting on me, spurting out like a bomb, fusion bomb, spurting out like a bomb with his, par with his paradise on the walls of my cranial niche where he has encrusted his nest. Fusée en bombe, je la ferai envers et contre Dieu, l'esprit de retenue, cacadeuse, qui ne cesse de péter sur moi, fusée en bombe avec son paradis, sur les parois de mon crâne niche, où il a incrusté son nid. Fart against fart, a double rifle shot, un double coup de fusil. The electrocuting pencil stroke is not merely going to reach out the divine battery. It explodes the bomb that God, the parasite, has deposited in his skull like an animal that has taken up residence there, where this animal God installs its offspring, like a dog that finds its niche there, or a bird that hatches eggs in its nest. About this drawing, Otto says that it is, I quote, willingly botched, volontairement bâclé, thrown on the page like some scorn for the forms and the line, so as to scorn the idea taken up and managed to make it fall. The maladroit idea of God willingly made not to stand up straight on the page. L'idée maladroite de Dieu volontairement mal dressée sur la page. One would have to analyze the whole quasi-description, the active and playful interpretation of this sexual maladroitness of God. It commands a jubilant admiration, notably as concerns the play of the tomb and the bomb, the tomb or fall and the bomb of the divine maladroitness and of a detumescence that is both graphic and sexual. The meaning and the sonorous form of the words tomb in French, tomb, tombe, tombeau, that is, uh, grave, falling, tomb. The, the meaning and the sonorous forms of these words play with the graphic forms of the drawing. The text attacks with the word tombeau grave, tomb, and the first phrase ends or falls in its last word on the word tombe as verb, falls. L'œil qui les regarde tombe. The eye looking at them falls. So as a verb and not as a noun, la tombe, the grave or tomb. I, I quote from the uh, translation. The tomb, le tombeau, the tomb of everything waiting while God fools around with the instruments at the level of his belly that he hasn't known how to use, themselves maladroitly drawn so that the eye looking at them falls. Le tombeau de tout ce qui attend pendant que Dieu fait des bêtises, avec au niveau de son ventre les instruments dont il n'a pas su se servir, eux-mêmes maladroitement dessinés pour que l'œil qui les regarde tombe. A little further on, the phrase moves from the tomb to the tombeau, from the singular noun tomb, la tombe de mes fesses, the tomb of my buttocks, to its division or multiplication into double tombeau, double tomb. And the trajectory sets out from my own body, at once the belly of a pregnant and necrophorous mother, from whom emanates in a fall, as in the dropping of childbirth, the handicapped spirit of this retarded God. Then from the pregnant tomb of my body, the lines goes to the coffin, the cercueil, in which I, in which I am, or even the coffin that I uh, still am. La boîte de l'ange, dans mon double tombeau craquant, the angel's box in my double cracking tomb. So we are still reading this text, in this text, the active commentary, or even the credits, le générique, of the 
sexual maladroitness of God, which was drawn in February 1946. I wonder if it does not also refer to and agree with the picture from the following month, March 46, titled Le Théâtre de la Cru the Theater of Cruelty. The Theater of Cruelty, that's the title of this drawing. Metonymy of Otto's entire work, The Theater of Cruelty, also exhibits the mortuary box in a more identifiable fashion as a double, doubled coffin, twice doubled around the double mummy that is thereby commemorated, commummified, so to speak, commomified, commomotumified by the blows. In the margins of another picture, Death and Man, La Mort et l'Homme, the concerted configuration of the verb tombe, fall, conjugated in four, in four grammatical forms, tombe, tombant, tombe, et tombe, fell, falling, fallen, to fall. This configuration verges on the tomb-like boxes or coffins with or without padded lining. It is a matter then of producing a physical effect on the very body of the spectator, depriving him violently of his objectifying position as a spectator, as contemplative voyeur, by affecting his very eye. It is a matter of changing the eye with the drawing, of inventing or adding a new eye or through the violence of a paradoxical prosthesis of restoring a lost eye. Through this surgical operation, through the ophthalmological traumatism produced there by a sort of virtual fire or laser, and Arto names at this point virtuality, the drawing would thus proceed to detach the retina, but this detachment would permit the installation of the thing itself. The skeleton of death in the eye itself, without support, separated from the page, lifted from a subjectile. That is, subjectile is a word that Otto uses to, to refer to the, the papers, to the support, the, 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 what is under the subject. The subject that figures that from which the retina is thus detached, the body of the thing itself, death or its skeletal representation, would then come to plant itself in the gaze. It would come to find its place there where it finally takes place, namely my eye. What will be important from now on in these traits and these blows is also the attack on the support, on the subject hill. This way of putting an end to the stable support and therefore to art and the museum, to the static state of the work of art and to the state with a capital S, period, the state, period. But also to all that can be figured by the support, beginning with the matrix or the patrix, the father, mother, the pair of the pater mater. Speaking of his drawing, Death and Man, insofar as it, I quote, remains then not in space but in time, Otto, in fact, dreams, I would like, he says, Otto dreams of a sort of virtual prosthesis of the gaze, a virtual prosthesis of the gaze. He dreams of putting in place a new eye in another place. He would like the event of another taking place in the eye. I quote, I would like, I would like that while looking at it as close as possible, one finds there that sort of detachment of the retina, that virtual sensation of a detachment of the retina, 
that I had, that I had, while detaching the skeleton from the top of the page as a putting in place for an eye, for an eye. The skeleton, and he goes on, the skeleton from the top without the page with its putting in place in my eye, with its putting in place in my eye. So, death, eye, phallus, phallus, blow. The discourse on the sexual maladroitness of God is addressed, first of all, to God, to an imitated God incorporated in oneself, and the evil, the grievance, concerns the tragic history of this forced incorporation. Each drawing, as we will see, is only a blow, only strikes a blow, and this blow only falls on someone to the extent that far from being a representative reference, either figurative or abstract, it attacks, it apostrophizes it, uh, an addressee hmm, to the extent that it knows how to strike a blow, un coup ferir, against this one and not that one. Such and such a day, in such and such a place. Now, any spectator of the drawing can become the addressee, that is, the target of this blow. And the result is inevitable to the extent that receiving, seeing, reading, he has the addressee has to fill it by the message or the missile, the insult or assault or the assault of the apostrophe. I quote, while, while you are fodding in your clouds, you species of spiritual incompetence, he addresses God here, while you are fodding in your clouds, you species of spiritual incompetence, issued from the tomb of my buttocks. Yak ta konka heke narina ege narina anarina. I turn Angel's box in my double cracking tomb. Je retourne la boîte de l'ange dans mon double tombeau crac, crac, craquant. The polyphony of the near homonyms of tomb and tombeau, which scan the narrative of the sexual maladroitness of God, the illustrious history of belief in God, can be heard rebounding from bon to pudibonderie, prudishness by means of the soul qui se débonde, that unstoppers itself, up until the maladroit drawing causes one, once again the idea to fall, that is, tomber. Across this polyphonic narrative of alliterations, bombe, tomber, pudibond, débondé, the latter is very close to débondé, that is, to give into detumescence the fall of the phallus, or the pencil in sexual and graphic maladroitness. One deciphers also a whole genealogy of God, spirit, religion, namely of all that is engendered in the repression or retention of retenue, of modesty and prudishness. How is one to read this retention or restraint, this retenue, retenue the, the, the word is atos, and he repeats it, aligning it both with modest reserve and with the intestinal retention of excrement. Retenu is at once the origin and the manifestation of spirit, of the inside, of God, of the holiness, of the holy virgin, la vierge, or holy candle, le cierge. It is also that which in intestinal retention produces the wind of spirit, the thought that Arthur also calls, I quote, the internal gas of spirit. And let us not forget that gas is also geist, an etymological and semantic affinity. Gas, geist, geist, spirit is also ghost, the specter 
that comes to haunt or parasite the body proper, the stranger that must be expelled outside. This Holy Spirit, this restraint, this farting retention, is what Otto wants to deliver himself from. But first of all, he wants, through the coup of his drawing, of this drawing, to assign it to others and recall that it is not his. It has been imposed on him like a tax or a horn from hell, an impo, a suppo, by a law, a law of the holy family that, first of all, stole his own body proper. We could analyze all the elements of this drawing, all the chalk strokes, that's not the right one, but it will, this one will wait. It, I'm also, uh, again, commenting on this, la maladresse, la maladresse sexuelle de Dieu. All the choke strokes, coup de fusain, in blue, green, rose, ochre, and black, that describe, but one should say, rather weave, plot, or provoke this universal catastrophe. At the same time, the vertical movement of the fall, the detumescence of the phallus, when it lets fall the spectral sperm of its spirit, and the inward agitation or even fermentation of the viscera that produces the internal fart or gas or spirit, or spirit at the center of the feminine belly, at the heart of the breasts, au sein des seins, he says, which perhaps let fall the holy family milk along a divine milky way. It also it is also a Bible of interiorized nourishment and of excremental dejection, a treatise on the alchemy that transfigures the substance of shit into incorporeal spirit. This clinical catalog of psychopathology derives all man's illnesses from a sexual awkwardness, a sexual maladroitness of God who, through usurpation and imposition, has become within himself his own awkwardness, the maladroitness of man lacking in spirit and sick in spirit, en mal d'esprit. The same drawing, in the same blow, will have to denounce it, correct it, redress it, but also expulse it by exorcising it. The text and the drawing engender each other. One cannot say which one erects the other or precipitates the other in its call. I can do no more than underscore a few words in French. Let me read first in French. Fusil, racine de l'électrique nuit. Fusil pour transpercer l'illutoire misère, l'illustre histoire de croire en Dieu. Quand c'est moi qui le fais, prononce l'âme. Quand j'éjacule ce paix foireux, et je dis que mon âme c'est moi, et que s'il me plaît de faire une fille qui un jour veuille se coucher sur moi, faire caca et pipi sur moi, je la ferai envers et contre Dieu, l'esprit de retenue cacadeuse qui ne cesse de péter sur moi, fusée en bombe, avec son paradis sur les parois de mon crâne niche, où il a incrusté son nid. That's a passage I read in translation a moment ago. And the passage continues. I'll translate more or less and insert certain terms in French. Now the soul must unstopper itself, se débond, se débonder, of all the holy substances species that nourish this antique orgy of the spirit against my man's carcass on the ground of illnesses. For I, man, I have suffered from the spirit without a soul on this bed layer of my body that might finally, after life, believe itself to be a child on a bed. Will this soul have eternal rest against the in internal gas of the spirit of jealousy, le gaz interne de l'esprit de la jalousie, from which men erected, erected God. For the retention, retenu, of prudishness, pudibonderie, for the retention of prudishness is not mine, but that of all those who are immodest in spirit and who imposed the holy virgin on things so as to satisfy themselves on the sly protected from this scandal idea, idée cierge. Les impudiques d'esprit qui imposèrent la Sainte Vierge 
satisfaire l'idée cierge that lays waste the sex of man in order to supply nothingness of spirit. And here, here are to analyze the word esprit, d'esprit, in this unheard of proposition or exposition. To lay waste the sex of man in order to supply the nothingness with spirit. Spirit will thus be a dressing, an ornament, a supplement of non-being as a charge, tax, imposition of the tax by the hellhound, munus, and munition that comes to corrupt originary immunity. Spirit is the being that corrupts originality, originary immunity, thereby defined as non-being. But this non-being is in truth the essence of spirit, which is, but its armed supplement, the rifle or the munition with which it arms itself, dont il se munit, and Hato goes on. This drawing is willingly botched, thrown on the page, like some scorn for the forms and the line, so as to scorn the idea taken up and manage to make it fall, tombe. The maladroit idea of God willingly made not to stand up straight, volontairement mal dressé on the page, but with a distribution, with a distribution and a blaze of consonant colors and forms that make fast this ill-fashioned thing live. I read again this important sentence. The maladroit idea of God willingly made not to stand up straight on the page, but with a dis distribution and a blaze of consonant colors and forms that make this ill-fashioned thing live. Qui fasse vivre cette malfaçon. Qui fasse vivre cette malfaçon. When, in that case, is there a work and a work of art? Where is one to situate virtually for this act of voluntary maladroitness, for this malfaçon, or this mauvais coup, this botched stroke and low blow, a place of reception, an assembly, a subjectile, a support, a church or museum wall? What happens? At the instant, the bad deed is done. Le mal est fait. The satanic evil. I am Satan. Je, Satan, c'est moi, he said. What remains at the instant the bad is done, le mal est bien fait. The mal also of maladresse, awkwardness, and of malfaçon. The mal of the scorn for the forms and the lines. The mal, the evil, or the bad... Uh, of the destruction of art and its place, or even of its archive, its cumulative conservation, its reproduction, and its exhibition, its virtualization, and the museographic management of its surplus value, its canonizing idealization, or its academic sublimation. At the instant the bad is done, done well, it sublates its chaos. It keeps the trace of the blow struck in a counter blow or a doubled blow. It thus saves its dissonance in some consonants. Arthur's word. This is done, and the evil is done. At the instant that, and this takes place, in fact, in an instant, a blow and act. At the instant that, he says. But this instant must be divided or doubled in order to keep the trace of its own blow. And in this duplicity of the blow, destruction is kept, but it is also kept from pure and simple destruction. Evil against evil. Evil in evil. The work and the work of art have already found the support and the place of virtual reception, already a museum, to safeguard the memory of their auto-destruction. This saving, this salvation, if you want, also means loss. And this contradiction of the doubled blow is no doubt the cruelest fate of the cruelty out of which Arthur will have made his theater. Art is saved 
or redeemed, perhaps from the fall, by that which, in Arthur's words, makes live the malfaçon itself, makes live the malfaçon, the, the maladroitness, namely the art, I quote again, of a distribution and a blaze of consonant colors and forms that make this ill-fashioned thing live. The speed of a precipitation is an essential trait of the operation, the speed. The line must follow the precipitous rhythm of the sketch. But this absolute speed cannot erase the minimal insistence of the trait divided in its act by the very doubling of the blow, by its repercussion and by its echoing. The drawing keeps the witnessing trace of this precipitation, of this fashion that saves the ill-fashioned by keeping it, exactly like a survivor and a capital witness of the precipitation. Aim is taken at God's head and sex. After having noted the distribution and the blaze of continent colors and forms that make this ill-fashioned thing live, causing it thus to live on, Ato insists twice on haste, on what he calls the hasty sketch, ative esquisse, and the hasty fashion, ative façon, I quote. Witness the head at the top, like an egg barely indicated, and the bird's rays of hair that could have been but a hasty sketch in a more elaborated, elaborate drawing. But I wanted their hasty fashion to remain. I wanted their hasty fashion to remain at the summit of this red puppet. I'm sorry, I don't have the, the, the slide here. Like a spot that is going to spread out over the clothes and weigh down on the piece sex. So there must be a reverberating, a retentissement, remaining of the very thing that does not remain, namely haste, the hot potch collapse of impatience that botches everything. It must remain. There must be a witness to the haste and to the malfaçon, to the hasty fashion. The hasty fashion must remain one must make it live and live on as witness to the divine collapse after the blow is struck and the color must run from the egg head like a yolk that blushes red in shame, like sperm become peace. That is uh, thought when it falls into representation, said Hegel. Another reason I say, I said foudroyer, is to describe the traces of a passage, the time, rhythm, and landscape of a sleepless white night, the earth and sky of the works assembled in the museum called MoMA. Foudroyer, foudre, foudre, lightning. Foudre, lightning is a word that Hato, Hato himself chose so as to speak of what happened when one day began for him a certain experience of the drawing. Not of drawing in general. And he had been drawing and painting since adolescence with a technical mastery that is so much in evidence. But of this drawing that one day, beginning in 1939, he could no longer dissociate from writing. He then names lightning food twice. In the word foudre, one hears the explosion of a missile, the deflagration of the breath or the conflagration of an incendiary bomb. bomb. But one, cal one also hears other words that Arto regularly associates with it. Close to foudre, there is foutre, copulation and sperm, which multiplies the affinities with the word Poudre, powder, one of Arthur's favorite words for designating gunpowder, as well as seminal dust, grease paint or face powder, 
paint pigment or that which is reduced to ashes in destruction by fire. And especially with the monosyllable fou. So you have foudre, foutre, poudre, and fou. F O U. And that is mad, crazy. And that's with the word momo, which means, among other things, something like crackpot. Foudre is not far from foutre. It inflames the living sperm. And this mad torch is nothing other than the body proper itself, I quote. For what is the spirit without the body, asks Arto in Suppo et Suppliciation. Answer, a limp rag of dead foutre. So if the spirit without the body is dead or artificial, seminal fluid, dead fluid or artificial seminal fluid, as for the body, it is vital sperm, burning jism, hot cannon barrel. And the force of the drawing would be to expose it. At the opening of the famous text from April uh, 1947, entitled 10 years since language left, 10 ans que le langage est parti, Arto lets loose the lightning bolt, I quote, 10 years since language left, since in its place came in the, this atmospheric thunder, this lightning, said foudre, in face of the aristocratic pressuration of beings, of all noble beings, of the ass, cunt, of the dick. Ten years since language left. What a declaration. It announces that language left me, for it has gone and left me without it, abandoned me, but also more secretly that it left or departed from me, that it took, it took its departure from me, thereby proceeding under my impulse by the lightning of my drawing. For further down, like a meteoric body detached from it by the lightning itself, the word fu, mad, is associated with momo. Momo means also, among other things, mad. Now, the lightning of the madman, la foudre du fou, passes by way of the drawing's body, more precisely by the body of a crayon noir, a black pencil. And the black pencil, le crayon noir, the body drawing the drawing, the lineous and rigid verticality that strikes the blow, the pencil blows, he says, is a lead as black, black like evil, but also sometimes as colorful in its wooden coffin as the paper scorched by flame. I mean by these les sorts, the spells that are waiting for us. Uh, a series of, of slides, these, these spells, see? I'll come back to this. At Rodez, Arto must often use, as we know, a black graphite pencil, but also sometimes those waxy colored crayons that children play with. He found the support for his drawing, that is also the targets for his pencil blows, in stationary or typing paper. The Momo presents himself or presents his truth, the fiery truth of a thunderbolt that follows the flash of lightning, and this blow strikes in the night like the blow from a madman's black pencil, crayon noir. Ten years since language left. How? By a blow, by un coup. Anti-dialectical of the tongue, un coup de la langue. By a blow, uh, anti-dialectical of the tongue, by my black pencil pressing, and that's all. Which means that I, the madman and the moment I go on, 
which means that I, the madman and the momo, maintain nine years in an insane asylum for passes of exorcism and magic, and because supposedly I imagined that I had found a magic and that was mad, one must, be, one must believe that it was true. It was true. It was true does not mean it was real. No more than in the entitled drawing from January 1945 that bears as it, as, at its head, at the top of itself, the, the header that then becomes its title. Uh, the, the next one, please. Uh, jamais, uh, yes, you see at the top of the, the drawing, jamais réel et toujours vrai. Never real and always true. Never real and always true. Always true then is said of a truth without realism and without naturalism and without figuration. The capital height of its sentence without verb, never real and always true, receives from below the light of an interpretation. At the foot of the drawing, in the form of an incrimination of art, or even more precisely, of the signifier art, of this morsel of the name art, arto, art qui se fait mal. Art, is art that is badly done, that does itself harm, that undoes itself and reverses itself into the maladroitness of a rat, a rat spleen, or one of those rats, of those rat syllables that runs in crowds and teams throughout Arthur's corpus. I, I spent some time counting all the ra syllables in Arto. Now, on the lower edge of the drawing, one follows what could have well be the explicating consequence of the never real and always true, namely, not art, non pas de l'art, mais de la raté du Soudan et de Dahomey. Not art, that's the, the sentence at the, at, the, at the bottom of the drawing. Not art, but some raté of the sudden endahome, sudden endahome. In the passage cited earlier, uh, coup sur coup, one blow after another, Arto was already calling for a um, coup de la langue, a blow of the tongue, by a blow anti-dialectical of the tongue by my black pencil pressing. Here comes another blow, no doubt the same one, the same blow, but this time divided or multiplied, doubled, repercussed, in the plural. Pencil blows, plural. My pencil blows. One cannot understand, I believe, the operation of Arthur's graphic cruelty without a thinking experience of the double blow, without this trace of repercussion. The repercussion of electrocution constructs and destroys at the same time the history of art in its museographic truth. In any case, the drawing inaugurates by inscribing the charter of a new Kabbalah that will say what today, <coughs> while projecting its excremental projectiles onto the old Kabbalah, that of tradition, which is to say, as the very name Kabbalah indicates, onto the very tradition of yesterday. And Kabbalah and Kabbal also connotes, in ordinary language, conjuration, plot, conspiracy. What is entered into in the drawing is the war of one conjuration against another, of one spirit, thus of one breath against another, a pneumatic, pneumatic polemos, one respiration against another, the conflagration between two inspirations and two conspiracies. And this is the end of art, of the history of art, with a capital A, of art for art's sake, the art whose cult we pretend to celebrate or end up celebrating in museums, even if that is not what they were meant for from the first blow, I quote. 
And I say then that with language set aside, it's lightning, a foudre, that I cause now to come into the human fact of breathing, respirer. While lightning is sanctioned by my pencil strokes, mes coups de crayon on the paper. And ever since a certain day in October 1939, I have never written without also drawing. I quote again. And ever since a certain day in October 1939, I have never written without also drawing. But what, I, but what I am drawing are no longer the themes of art transposed from the imagination onto the paper. They are no longer effective figures. They are gestures, a verb, a grammar, an arithmetic, a whole Kabbalah. And that shits at the other, that shits on the other. No drawing made on paper is a drawing, the reintegration of a misguided sensibility. It is a machine that has breath, qui a souffle. Unquote. At the end of this famous text from April 1947, which removes drawing from art, from the themes of art, and at least four times makes of graphic lightning the emanation of vociferating breath, I quote, a breath that gave its fullest. It's been 10 years that with my breath I breathe heart forms. And again, all breath in the hollow architecture. Again, not one that is not a breath thrown with all the forces of my lung, the force of my lungs, with all the sifting of my respiration. So the end of art, but, is, but the same thing as the end of writing for the sake of writing, of the letter for the letter. This is the last word of the text, I quote. And this means that it is time for a writer to close shop and to leave the written letter for the letter, end quote. So to leave the written letter for the letter, this can mean two things. It can mean, in the first place, the end of the written letter for the letter, as one said, the end of art for art's sake, of literature for the sake of literature. It can also mean the end of the written letter so as to make room for the true letter, with a view to this letter finally, which would no longer be written, but in a single shot, breathe, drawn, so to speak, respirated, traced. And this is the drawing, the character of Arthur de Momo. The latter already at Rodez claimed to have a drawing know-how that through an apparent maladroitness made plain the abandonment of what he called the principle of drawing, the end of the school of art, end of art, so as to retake possession of his body against the obscure forces of the spirits that were trying to dispossess him of it. Speaking no doubt about a drawing in which he represented himself as king of the Incas, as he does here, le roi des Incas, That's a picture I've seen for years and years in the apartment of my friend Paul Tivna, and which is now in the museum. Arthur made a claim for the soul against the spirit, the living soul as a sort of physical or nervous work of the body and of the end, la main and the manner and the maneuver by means of a sort of fictive tabula rasa of the history of art. I quote, as if he had learned nothing. He was describing by the same token, at the same blow, all his other writings, drawings, excuse me. Uh, let me quote. This drawing, like all my other drawings, is not that of a man who does not know how to draw, but that of a man who has abandoned the principle of drawing and who wants to draw at his age, my age, as if he had learned nothing by principle, by law or by heart by art, but only by the experience of work. And I should say, not instantaneous, but instant, non instantané, mais instant. Mean, I mean immediately deserved. Deserved in relation to all the forces in time 
that are opposed to the manual work, and not only manual, but nervous and physical of creation. Which is to say, again, the, he goes on, again, the taking possession of the soul into spirit, and it's putting back into place in the being of reality. And who today will say, will say what? If I have learned how to look even a little at the portrait that bears this address without address, it is to some extent thanks to the eyes and the knowledge of my friend Paul Tevna, to whom, with your permission, I dedicate this lecture so as to honor her memory. And we are many who, without her, cannot conceive the return of Arto, the return of Arto de Momo uh, at Moma in here, and the living on of what must be called the corpus of Saint Antonin. Among the hypotheses concerning the choice of the nickname Momo during the period when Arto began to be unable any longer to write without also drawing, I will privilege here two threads. What I would like to make clear concerning them, because Paul Tevinen does not say this, is that these two threads are crossing, or were, cro were crossing in New York uh, uh, at the time, even as they appear to be both contradictory and complementary. They cross the two origins of Antonin Artaud. These two top of the name Antonin Artaud, and the life of Antonin Artaud. These two topoi, these two figures of the Momo, are also two birthplaces of Arto. The return of Arto Momo would figure at the same time <coughs> their repetition and a third birth, another rebirth or renaissance. Birth, the rebirth of a brand new corpus of a body without organ, organless body, is the great concern of all the drawings and portraits exhibited in, in the MoMA, from the sexual maladroitness of God to the execration of the father-mother, execration de père-mère, from the being and its fetuses to the immaculate conception, from the, what is called the projection of the, new, of the true body to the numerous self-portraits. Let, let's see some self-portraits here. Self-portraits that would, one could interpret as so many processes of auto-engendering. Each self-portrait is a regeneration of oneself. Recall the motif of here lies, CG, I quote. Me, Antonin Artaud, I am my son, my father, my mother, and me. Lever of the imbecilic periplus where engendering gets entangled. The papa, mama, Periplus and the child, sued from the grandma's ass much more than from the father-mother, I quote. From one end to the other of Arto's corpus, an immense and turbulent and blaspheming poetics of generation repudiates, along with the Christian body and its holy family, repudiates the whole history of art that installs the body, this body of the parasited lunatic in churches and then transfers them from the churches to the museums, in the private or state capitals of arts capital. Now, one of the possible filiations of Momo leads us toward Marseille, where Arthur was born 100 years ago, exactly, 96, toward the Provencal Spanish and Catalan languages. There, and especially in Marseille, a swarm of meanings of Momo buzzes around childhood, ingenuousness, naivety. Momo is the mom, the kid, the mioche or brat. And thus the couple or pair, mother, child, mam, mama, mam, momi, mom, momo. One can also recognize here the figure of the fool or madman, momo, as village idiot, the innocent, the nutcase, in that semantic zone where Mistral derives Momo from the Catalan Moma, which has the sense of currency or money, not far from la Momo, meaning commodity as delicacy, candy. 
Thus, the MoMA is money, currency. Just as la momo would be the child's treat to be bought and consumed. And momo, the word momo, retains in advance the memory of moma, poetically, literally. It mothers and commemorates and mummifies with a watchful eye on several letters that we will hear ring out in a moment in the design of the drawing. At the risk of cadaverizing it, MoMA can preserve in itself the maternal matrix in the very matter of mortifying gestation. In an inseparable way, inscribed on the rivers on the reverse side of the same coin, the other the other semantic film returns from Marseille, which was a Greek city at the beginning, to Smyrna, to the Cyclades, Cyclades, to Greece, to that neo-Greek polyglotism that Arthur also spoke in his childhood, in the midst of a family that still kept the Greco-Turk memory of its origins. Greek is very active in his language, in his glossopoiesis, and in his drawings. For example, Anna in the upper left corner, I think it can be seen here. So Greek is very present in, in Arthur's um, drawings uh, at the, uh, in the execration of father and mother. It often comes back elsewhere, notably uh, in the sexual malodorousness of God where the glossopoetic ani links it, its necessity to the quasi-normality of other words such as ani in Greek, he says ani in Greek, anixa, that old ananke of the soul, old necessity of the soul. So in Greek, momos, in Greek, momos is the god of mockery. He illustrates terrifying sarcasm with a grimace that we also find in the momo buffoon. He is a spirit pneuma full of forces, says Hermes to him, of him. A hundred years ago, this pagan god still made his appearance in the festivals of southern France. One would now have to cross these two familial and semantic genealogies, these two geographies of the place, that is, of the body of Arto. On the one hand, the return of Momo the child, the innocent, the helpless fool madman who comes back to put on trial the machine that detains and destroys him, body and soul, this institutional machine being a culture that is at once social, medical, psychiatric, religious, political, metaphysical, a police machine and a state machine, as well as an artistic machine. And the museum is one of its powers of foundation, of conservation, legitimization, canonization, assimilation. So a power which is both public and private. The capital city at the head of its capital. The market of a state cultural speculation. But at the same time, on the other hand, indissociably, the indictment of the innocent child who bears the grievances of this wounded, assassinated, mortified, mummified Momo also strike the blows. He is the unleashing of a satanic mockery, that of the god Momos, of his blasphemies, insults, assaults, accusations, and merciless sarcasms, of his incriminations and recriminations. Given and returned, all these blows can be felt. They still strike in each pencil stroke. A burst of painful laughter cuts across the unarmed passion of he who has just been born. A child seeks rebirth after 20 centuries and not just 100 years of history. He is learning again and teaches us a language before language where and when language left. Thus, a child glossopoet 
becomes the inseparable accomplice of a god of irony who laughs in your face and defiles all cultural institutions and the history of art and the discipline of drawing and the criteria of proper evaluation, good manners, and the market of arts criticism, its salon, galleries, foundations, and museums. The indictment has no limit, I quote. Modern historical life is the price of a tremendous and false bewitchment. Act of accusation against this world bring to the fore the bewitchments. Who I am? I am Antonin Artaud, but I have always suffered from men more exactly, from society." Unquote. And who today will say what? Written long, not long before the death of Arto, certain words in this portrait of Jeanne de Ruy, July 1947, were erased one day by Jacques Prevel while he was noting them down, also on July the 2nd, 1947. Even as he was noting down the verbal message transcribing it separately to set it aside, Prevel destroyed on the drawing what he was thus archiving elsewhere in his own diary. Was he inspired to do it by some unconscious lucidity? The words that were thus attacked have since been reconstituted, which is to say reproduced, produced once again with the help of Antonin Artaud himself, Paul Thévenin and Jeanne de Ruy who was uh, Prevel's uh, uh, mistress at the time. The words were therefore, through this reproduction, returned to themselves, in effect, also prepared for the catalogue of an art gallery, the margin of a collection or a museum, but not for the museum itself. They were thus rescued from their loss, but in their loss itself, saved in some way by the author, by a spiritual heir, Paul Thévenin, and by the model of the portrait that remains all the same mutilated. Restored to one side, exiled outside the work, these words, in fact, are no longer right on the body of the drawing of which they are a part. So the body of, or the cadaver of the words are gathered up, to be sure, but their remains no longer form one body with the body of which they were once a part. One wonders what a museum keeps or exhibits when it holds only the scars of an effacement, the traces of a destruction or dismemberment, already a ruin, a cemetery haunted by already decomposed cadavers. Now, as for the erased words of this drawing, they are not insignificant in their secret affinity. The first of these words are je suis, I am. She, the, uh, the last are chie sur moi, shit on me. And between this I am and shit on me, Jacques Prevel had also erased a je fais, je fais, I do or I make. Not je fais mal, I do badly, or je fais le mal, I do evil. Uh, the mal of the malfaçon of the maladresse, but merely je fais. So you, you, we have je suis et je fais. I am, I do. Shit on me. What a sequence. What a consequence. If one thinks that in French je fais by itself can mean I shit. Here now is the integral declaration of this ego sum, ego facio. Je suis, je fais. Um, let me read this. I am, je suis, still too young to have wrinkles. I make these, that, so I am was erased, hmm? young, young too erased. I make these erased, children of poor wrinkles, and I, say, I send them <coughs> to do battle in my body. Only I lack energy, and this is obvious. And I am still terribly romantic, like these drawing that represents me, in fact, too well, and I am weak, a weakness, shit on me, and shit on you. So half erased, this declaration belongs to the body of the work, but like a confession, an avowal of weakness that moreover begins 
by presenting in this portrait of another woman a self-portrait. It's a, the portrait of another woman which says, I am. It betrays me, he says, it betrays myself. It all awkwardly betrays the truth of my awkwardness. It unveils me in my weakness. This drawing, he says, that represents me, this drawing that represents me, in fact, too well, and I am weak, a weakness. Though it's a self-portrait in a certain way. But Otto is not content to comment in the margins of the self-portrait of the other sex. He points it out. Deictic exhibition, stroke of exposition. We see them operating right on the work in the space of the emblematic subscription. You remember what I said, or sup superscription, with analogy and subversion I've recalled at the beginning. A bit of finger seems to fall back like a phantom limb on the subjectal. This drawing, he says, that represents me. And above that one reads, here is a drawing, here is a drawing. That's the deictic gesture. He shows the drawing, he points to the drawing. Here is a drawing. This deictic performative, which points with the finger while saying that it shows what it shows, can also be represented in turn like a report that has been entered into the record of, of acts, dont il est pris acte, I would say in French. Here it is, the, this visual archive of an act or a blow that says what it does, doing thereby what it says. But it records itself with the same blow in the representation. In French, one would say that the one who draws prend acte de son acte, records or registers his act. For act also means the archive that keeps a legitimate and readable trace of what was done, deliberated, and accomplished. Abyssal performative, imperformative, the deictic of this self-presentation doubles the confession or regret of an order given to the spectator voyeur, to the visitor to the museum. Deficate on me, shit on me. As for me, je fais, I make, I do. He is what I make. Children. I make children, he says. So you, in turn, multiple visitor, anonymous voyeur, lost in the crowd, get into the act. Don't look at me with your eyes. Now, shit, shit on me. So, shit on me does not mean merely accuse my fallen state, as he says, or despise the dejection, fault of falling, the weakness that I, I've just confessed. For it has always been the case that Arto identifies the work with fissures, which are children that one makes. He says, I make these children, that is, je fais ces, en je fais ces enfants, fesses, fesses, huh? and fesses, and sprinkling, sprinkling to. He does assimilate defecation to making a work, which is to say, as well to be to the gift, to the weapon, and to the phallus, as Freud has shown. Huh? The ch child, the, the gift, the weapon, the phallus, and the excrement. To the coup. He even made a certain fashion of saying, merde, shit, the trait of an address, an awkward, maladroit address of the drawing, a certain fashion of drawing well in the maladress itself, and of addressing well, as directly and adroitly as possible, the trait of the drawing, a good fashion to keep the capital witness of this malfaçon. Three months before the portrait of Jenny de Ruy, that you're looking at in April 1940, 1947, several months before to have done with the judgment of God, pour en finir avec le jugement de Dieu, Arto let another merde, shit, ring out. He preferred it on this occasion, not far from an apocalyptic last judgment, which alone, he said, will be able to decide between values. He cried out merde in a text that has since become famous because for anyone interested in Arto's graphic art, 
probably the most indispensable text along with the catalog for an exhibition in 1947. That fundamental piece of writing on the human face which should be studied syllable by syllable and to which I will return briefly in a moment. The text I'm citing now cries out merde to the adroit drawing, to the art drawing, to the world of art, its conservatory, its archive, its history, its museography, and finally, to this world here. Arto does not say this merde himself. He says that the drawings say it. And this happens in the course of a scene that does not celebrate a centenary like today, but 10 times less, an act of birth only 10 years old. It was the act of birth of an absolute drawer of someone, Arto Mumu, who no longer does anything but write while drawing, draw while writing, of someone for whom the graphene, the zoographene, as the Greeks used to say, the writing of the living, zoographene, becomes the absolute manifestation. After the incipit 10 years since language left, after the dating is duplicated a first time, and ever since a certain day in October 1939, have never written without also drawing, and then a second time, I say that for the last 10 years with my breath, I breathe, I breathe out hard, compact, opaque, frantic forms. So after the calendar of this graphic vow, after the anniversary of this oath, that is to never again write without drawing at the same blow, after this periodization, that would offer us a hypothesis with which to visit the exhibition or organize the rezoned chronology of the catalog, Arto presents his drawing notebooks. It is a constellation, he says. Constellation, that's a celestial, celestial light. And we are not far from the lightning. A constellation which has, or a celestial light, which has already left the world, at least this, this here world. For it is on this here world that Arto's drawings from another world unleash their excrement like bullets and says and say shit I quote in translation such are in any case the drawings with which I constellate all my notebooks in any case the hall or oh the hall it is not on this side of the world it is not in this gesture of the world it is not in the gesture of this here world that I say that I want and it will indicate what I think. One will see it, one will feel it, one will realize it from my maladroit drawings, but so slight, so sly, and so adroit to say shit to this here world. What are they? What do they mean? The innate totem of man, the grigri to return to man, unquote. I would like to pose uh, for a moment after a detour on this Grigri, in the vicinity of which I interrupted my quotation. Grigri are generally defined as amulets, cult objects. They are not meant in the first place to represent. Through their form and sometimes through what they represent, beyond what they show, they are acts that are destined rather to produce an effect, to cast a spell, to strike a blow, to affect someone, heal or kill, save or condemn. Grigri are efficacious works, operations, that beyond art make a work. What then is the place of the Grigri in the work, or rather in the existence of Arto? They occupy a particular place, and at the same time, they are every place. They seem to cover the field that they open up. How so? If by referring to the calendar that I just evoked, 10, 10 years since language left, one attempted at least as a fiction to scan the history of the graphic art signed by Arto, one would distinguish clearly two periods. That would be the first time of the 
the well-ordered or classic works, those in which is affirmed an admirable technical mastery, albeit apparently not very inventive. These are the landscapes in gouache from 1919. And then the still life and, and oil from 1919 uh, again, this uh, next one. Uh, a series of studies of portrait or self-portrait. Uh, go on. That's charcoal or pencil or pen and ink from around 1920-23. Self-portraits. Um, this apparently academic period can be prolonged from 1924 to 1935 if one takes into account certain studies with an architectural or theatrical aim uh, for theater costumes or for the sets of the Chenchi. Uh, you go, go ahead. Next ones. Uh, The, the professional assurance of this art will never disappear, even in the second period, the most turbulent and, and striking foudroyant one. Until the end, until 1947, certain portraits will keep the mark of this skill, which one might in fact be tempted to term academic, if Arthur had not protested, yes, protested, and the word is his, and wanted to cleanse himself from, of any suspicion in this regard. Someone must have accused these portraits and self-portraits of academicism. After the fact, après coup in 1947, at the heart of what it would be naive to call the second period, he revolts once more against this reproach, in fact, and takes refuge behind the reference to Dubuffet. That's, I think it's Dubuffet. Uh, uh, at stake already still is the great question of the face as human figure, I quote. The human face is provisionally, I say provisionally, all that remains of the demand of this uh, revolutionary demand for a body that does not conform and never has conformed to this face. And don't come telling me that my faces are academic. This protest against the reproach of academicism develops especially during the last decade, that during the second period, even if its premises are to be found much earlier, deep within an untroubled history of art, what an untroubled history of art might call the first era, in the course of which, by the way, Arthur writes a great number of articles on exhibitions. And these, these articles form a corpus that deserves systematic study. One might then speak of the Salon of Artaud, following it in a tradition that I will not venture to identify with that of Diderot or Baudelaire. A theory of painting is sketched out there through reflections on a, num a great number of painters whose name I list in no particular order as they appear in these pages, Van Dongen, Suzanne Valadon, Matisse, Valoton, Marquet, Renoir, Gromère, Courbet, he's written on all these people, Cézanne, Manet, Odilon Redon, Bonnard, Vuillard, Dufy, Picasso, etc. Uh, as early as 1921, he praises what the character of the work places above any technical what is any technical question. We could overinvest and generalize this word character. It would then designate the blow of the graphene, the inscription of the imprint, the glyph, and glyph means blow, the hieroglyph that Arto makes into one of the master words of cruel writing, and that John's writing to drawing, but also to the human face whose portrait grasps in a character or at the same time the mask, the figure, and the truth of a persona, the singularity as well as the type, the violent stamp of the tuptane. In the code of computers, one might say that Arto 
already knew that writing is, first of all, what is called today an electro electroglyph. In the course of what I'm still calling for convenience the second and last period, Arthur unleashes his defense against the accusation of academicism. He does it in the hollow or creux of the face, if I can say, in the, what he called, crucible or creuset of its secret, le creuset du secret. And we must keep these French words, le creuset du secret. And Arthur is untranslatable from that point of view too. By digging it, by digging, digging into, that is en creusant, the enigma of the human face. As evidence, I think the extraordinary text that Arthur published in the catalog for the exhibition of his graphic works, which was also held, and the date is still the same, in July 1947. This piece of writing takes up a single large page and now bears as title, it's in keep it, the human face, le visage humain. Le visage humain, says Arthur, n'a pas encore trouvé sa face. Le visage humain n'a pas, it's difficult to translate. Le visage humain n'a pas encore trouvé sa face. The human face uh, hasn't found its, its face. It, it is still, the human face, such as it is, is still in search of itself. And Arthur does not want to lose forever the face he has lost. He wants finally to give it back to him. He wants to restore to the figure or face of man its truth, I quote. The human visage has not yet found its face. It is up to the painter to give it to him, end quote. So this logic of the given truth appeals thus to the gift of the face. Its cruel epiphany consists in returning by redeeming, for this gift still belongs to a logic of restitution. Portrait meaning le, uh, très pour trait, portrait of the trait for trait, le pour trait, très pour trait as redemptive salvation. By giving figure to the face, or rather, by giving a face to the figure, or a side to the face, the painter renders and returns the truth, the truth that is life, by saving from death. Otto had begun by saying that, I quote, the human visage is an empty force, a field of death. And a little later he adds, the human visage bears in fact a kind of perpetual death on its face, from which it is up to the painter precisely to save it by rendering and giving back to it its own traits. It is indeed in the hollow, in the crucible of the abyss that this verification, this process of truth, verification operates. It goes in search of itself in the generative and fertile cavity of a crucible, which presents, first of all, its negative figure. The hole, the bottomlessness of the abyss, the tomb, the place of death, or the crypt. The portraitist seeks to decrypt a truth, a truth to be rendered, returned, and given, to be constituted by restituting it, to be given in return even as it produces this truth for the first time in the holes, the false, or the cracks. The void of the artifice, chaos, kind, the abyss, that's what chaos mean, means, the abyss of the face with the opening of all its holes, of its mouth of truth, of its hollowed out eyes, that is the secret of this unthinkable non-distinction before the living force of the graphic trait and the blow it strikes. The word creuset appears here, moreover, before the double occurrence of its near anagram, le secret, creuset secret, and elsewhere glossing the machine of being, or draw, uh, the full title is la machine de l'être, ou dessin à regarder de travers, the machine of being or drawing to be looked at sideways, Arthur speaks of la tombe, la tombe creusée secrète de l'homme, the secret crucible tomb of man. I quote again, the, the, the human visage is an empty force. The human visage, such as it is, is still in search of itself 
with two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and the two auricular cavities that respond to the holes of the sockets like the four openings of the vault of approaching death. Unquote. And later the text will name once again those hollow, hollow openings that are, quote, the arching vaults of the eyelids or the cylindrical, cylindrical tunnel of the true mural cavities of the ears, or yet again, an empty eye turned back toward the inside. Now, if the truth of the traits both restitutes and gives, if it reveals and makes explicit to the same degree it invents what is not yet there, this is enough to break with those great figures in the history of art that are, on the one hand, the naturalist realism of figurative painting, and on the other, abstract painting. Otto claims to break with this history of art. He remonstrates successively against the one and the other of these figures of the human figure. Quote, it is absurd to reproach for being an academic, a painter who, given the lateness of the hour, goes on stubbornly, still reproducing the traits of the human face as they are. For as they are, they have still not found the form they indicate and designate." Unquote. But symmet symmetrically, Arthur launches his in invectives against that other academicism that is abstraction. He opposes cruelly, cruelty to me, with its true secret of death to the surface secret of what he called non-figurative painting. And the argument of this indictment takes as its target the history of art, the whole history of art as history of the portrait. Quote, for the thousands and thousands of years, in fact, that the human face has been speaking and breathing, one still has the impression that it has not yet begun to say what it is and what it knows. And I know of no painter in the history of art, from Holbein to Anger, who has succeeded in making it, this face of man, speak. Holbein's or Ingres, Anger's portraits are thick walls. Un, uh, unquote. I know of only one exception to the counter history that Arthur is telling himself in this way, that he launches like a missile of war against the entire history of art. In this filiation, there would be, more or less, only one work, there would be only one avowed figure of a legitimate and legitimating ancestor who, as Dubuffet did a moment ago, offers his backing and support. It is the, the head of Van Gogh. That, I quote, renders null and void all the attempts at abstract paintings that might be done after him until the end of all eternities. The head of Van Gogh completely exhausts all the most specious secrets of the abstract world in which non-figurative painting can indulge itself. That is why in the portraits I have drawn, I have avoided, above all, leaving out the nose, the mouth, the eyes, the ears, or the air. But I have sought to make the face that was talking to me tell the secret or an old human history that passed for dead in the heads of Ingres or Holbein. Now, one will not see the face of Artaud unless one hears the blow reverberate. I'm saying reverberate or resonate so as to insinuate my argument, namely that the blow is a double or duplicated blow that is its own echo, insisting and remaining and surviving in this way that the unique and instantaneous blow is originally, originally a duplicated, reverberating, echoing blow is what permits destruction to save the possibility of what it ruins. For example, art and the museum. For lack of time, necessary for a minute demonstration, allow me simply to let you hear the reverberation of the blows in the, in the text entitled The Human Face. Like the implosion of so many others, whether or not I have cited them, their noise is consonant with what, with that of the lightning, firearms, rifle shots, rockets, 
or charcoal, a fusée or fusain, which carried that force of a phallic head thrown against a parietal surface, a material support, a subjectal that will very often take on the maternal but also paternal figure of the Christian spirit of the Holy Family and of the father mother. <clears throat> In search of their form, he says, the trace of the human face from morning to night in the midst of 10,000 dreams pound as in the crucible of the essential palpitation. Or again, only Van Gogh was able to draw from the human head a portrait that was the explosive rocket of the beating of a shattered heart, his own. And again, for this havid butcher's face, and this is still a question of uh, uh, the, the head of Van Gogh, projected li like a cannon shot, excuse me, like a cannon shot onto the surface of the canvas, and that suddenly at one blow sees itself arrested by an empty eye turned, ba turned back toward the inside. I had promised to return to the Grigri in what, to what Athos himself calls in the cited passage, Grigri to return to man. What is the time of Grigri in view of the return to man? What fate, sore, spell, can we find for these sore, these spells, cast or lots thrown? What is their history? And in what way do these bearers of blows also, and at the same time, and the same blow, bear the question of the blow? In fact, if we uh, uh, try such a periodization of the graphic work of Otto. In fact, another period or time, the third time, if you want, I distinguished earlier between two times, a third time would have come along first to blur the distinction between the two sequences I evoked a moment ago. First, the period of, or, or time of disciplined training during the 20s and the 30s, which is to say the school exercise, <clears throat> the period of re relative conventionality, of quasi-realism, in which is evidenced the maturity of a tested technique, and then the time of insurrection, the creative mutation, the seismic upheaval, which after the electric lightning strike of 1939, after language has left, and especially from 45 to 48, the year of his death, would have given birth to a powerful, ingenious, and abundant graphic progeny. The latter, in fact, will increase by more than a factor of 10, the earlier corpus, by placing itself under the sign of the momo and of faint or sarcastic awkwardness. So this other time, the third one, but in chronological truth, the second one, would also come to wedge itself between the two others and ruin the very principle of a successiveness or a historical calendar of the works. This supplementary time would thus be neither a historical time, nor properly speaking, a third estate of the Ataldian revolution. If it were a third, a textis, testis, it would be the capital witness of what happened before and what will still happen after that. Uh, So from 37 to 39, the suspension of this intermediary epoch between the two hypothetical sequences, we know that Arthur made many of what he himself called saw spells, and these require an infinite analysis, infinitely adjusted to the singularity of each one. Uh, <clears throat> could you show rapidly a, a number of spells? Uh, That's, these are not the right ones. No, no, there is a problem with the. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, what's happening? Ah, here they are, voilà. Uh, the, these, uh, the, the, the following ones, okay. These swords, these spells, must not be acts of witchcraft, 
but on the contrary, exorcism, rejoinders to a malevolent action, conjurations meant to undo a spell, counter conjurations, antidotes to the mystical or initiating process. The constant battle of a polymorphous and satanic pervert for new enlightenments. Arthur writes at least two times that the sword, the sword, the spell, break, breaks any, any spell. So the counter conjuration, the counter initiation, the efficacy of the spell is not only real, it not only burns through an aesthetic simulation, it must be immediate. But, as a number of texts by Arthur show, but this immediacy must last. And this is what exposes it to its institutional drift. This is what distins it despite itself to remain and to alienate itself in a museum, bearing death in life, unable to bear any relation, any delay, any difference, any translating mediation. This immediacy must be current, non-virtual, eternal. Otto writes this at least two times, I quote. To a woman he writes, I quote, you will leave dead. You will not stop passing away and descending I cast you a force of death. And this sore will not be brought back, rapporté. It will not be postponed. Then to a man, I don't know whether it's a good one. Um, and this sword, sword will not be brought back. It will not be postponed. The efficacy of its action is immediate and eternal. And it breaks any spell. So this eternity, this enduring of the duplicated blow, exposes the spell to the museographic archive. But the latter, which Arto feared, did not prevent him, precisely, from denouncing the museum as the malevolent agent, agent as a conjuration that had to be, in advance, counter-attacked and counter-conjured. In one of these last saw, he explicitly accuses the museum of witchcraft. This accusation is made when he ironically addresses the saw, the spells, to the man of the museum, to the gallery of collectors and curators. Arto assaults and insults the, I quote, connoisseur of spells and other magical curiosity. We would also like to collect the sorts for his museum. Here is what can be deciphered on the rector of this sword. I don't know if it's the right one here. I quote, Sir, knowing you to be a great connoisseur of spells and other magical curiosities, I send you this spell, which constitutes a major evil, doing conjuration against all evil intentioned bewitchers. It is not part of the, and here's the word museum, it is not part of the museum of magus sorcerers and alchemists. Antonin Arthur. Now remember, those words that Jacques Prevel confessed to having erased, Arthur's mimed and contradictory, mimed and contradictory confession, and I am weak, a weakness, shit on me, call up in turn the confession of a misdeed committed by the picture's first spectator, Jacques Prevel, who would have first of all attempted to intervene on the work, to lay hands on it, and to retouch its form and meaning. Now, it pleases me to remark here a magical dramaturgy, a coincidence, both calculable and by chance uh, <clears throat> of dates, subjects, and acts. Today, well, we are July the 2nd, 1947, the date of the portrait of Jeannie de Ruy, date as well on which Prevel transcribes, erases, and in some way steals the words that we have just restored, but that remained unreadable in the picture. Well, several months earlier, Arthur had on two portraits of the same Prevel on April 26 and May um, 11th, 1947. Could we see them? No, that's a letter again, uh, again. The relation, address, or designation never appears, <clears throat> never happens without ferrying a blow, sans coup ferrir. And the blow is passed first to the head, to the posture of the head, au port de tête, in the portrait. So there were two portraits of Jacques Prevel 
one in profile and the other full face. On the one that shows the subject full face, this one, I think, yeah. Um, a sudden apparition of Marie, Marie, in the heart of the name, I quote, Yves Jacques Marie, Jacques Marie Prevel, usually we, uh, Jacques, we said, they said Jacques Prevel, but there was a, a, a second name, Jacques Marie Prevel, he, and Arthur puts the, the Marie uh, in its place. If Jacques Marie Prevel could only show this, know the sin that crushes him, and I, who do not believe in sin, I say the sin placed on him, Jacques Prevel crushes, let Jacques Marie Prevel not commit the sin that his whole face meditates, that in him Marie, Marie premeditates against Jacques Prevel. Sin from Marie to Jacques Prevel. One of the multiple readings of this graphic subject, subjectivity, the injunction, let Jacques Marie Prevel not commit the sin that Marie premeditates against him, him in him, that is right in the middle of his name and his head and his face, is that Marie, Marie, is at fault. The sin, first of all, is hers. The act of the portrait, the sort of action drawing, Momo's act, Momo's art, the counter blow of the trait must foment a counter conjuration. It must exorcise the holy spirit as well as the virgin born of the immaculate conception who comes to poison Jacques's body. As always in the drawings and portraits from this time, at stake is the history of sexual difference, of its Christian appropriation or perversion inasmuch as that history is tied to perversion and to the museo Christographic appropriation, the museo Eucharistic transubstantiation. Along the left border of the same portrait, satanic madness is named. The temptation twice mentioned at the heart of the one of the andro andro androgen and of the couple of sexual difference. All of this is figured doubly in a figure and in a face, one word per line, I quote. The androgen, broken down, took back the one and tempted it with man. But it's just that he tempted it with woman at the same time, and Saturn, the madman, was everywhere. But most of the words in the self-portrait of the other woman, Jeanne de Ruy, again, no, here it is again. <coughs> Most of the same words remain readable, in particular, the apparently insignificant sentence which will, with which we, it all began here today and who today will say what. It is signed Saint Antonin, sealing thereby the amusement, the irony of the god Momos, the mockery of historical, academical, musical self canonization. Let me read this. Uh, um, of course, saying almost nothing, the signature announces nearly everything, or all singularly, all of the other, all of the other, le tout de l'autre. And as opposed to the fallen humility that will follow and precipitate, apparently the falling off of the drawing, Saint Antonin is carried to the summit of hubris. The finger of a first deictic, here is a drawing, plays at going beyond the peak of the masterwork and the head of master of masters, Leonardo da Vinci, in person, I quote. Here is a drawing that goes beyond and way beyond Leonardo da Vinci, but it is not above all by the drawing by the all, the all of the other, le tout de l'autre, and on the facing side, along the bank of blue, and who today will say what? Sign Saint Antonin. Here is perhaps an inspired response to the suspended question, an amused retort to the question of the museum, a declaration signed by a drawer, painter, poet, actor, thinker, who canonizes himself, Marto, Momo act, Momo, Mom act as prediction of an art museum, of a Mom art, of a Mom Arto. By canonically signing his assumption or ascension, Saint Anthony, with the same blow, raises himself through drawing above the master of masters, Leonardo da Vinci, 
even as he denigrates doing it with the drawing and even with the work of art signed Arto. So, where are we today? The day of today. We are within, or we were within the walls of a museum of modern art, of a MoMA. What does it mean to say museum of modern art? Here, this canonizing institution, this place of sacralizing legitimation of the modern age, this pyramid of father maternal and speculative commemor market mummification, we call it then MoMA, M-O-M-A. O-A-A-O, MoMA, A-O, Antonin Arto, Arto, A-R-T-O, as you wrote it, A-R-T-A-U. He, Antonin Arto, who signed all the works exhibited at the MoMA, Arto itself, this predestined name that carries and carries within it, like an unborn child, the art that it nevertheless attacked with heavy hammer blows, the coup de marteau, and other rockets or projectiles of war. This name bequeathed by the pair of his father and mother. He had more than one fate in store for it and spelled it, it in many fashions. Sometimes he wrote it Arto, A-R-T-A-U. Sometimes Arto, A-R-T-O. One day he called himself and it was more than a nickname, Arto Le Momo, or in what was in his last one, in his last text in 1947, Arto Momo. These two names <laughs> then came to form a single one around the hyphen, a little like the pair of the father and mother in a writing painting entitled The Excretion of the of Father and Mother. L'Execration du Père Mère, 1946. <laughs> one will understand nothing of Arthur's visual work, if one does not attune oneself to the tempo of his letters and the rhythm of his words beyond coded language, beyond its grammar and its instituted semantics. Inversely, one will understand nothing of this transgression of coded language if one does not set out from the language it separates from. From here, the Greco-Latin sedimentation in French with which is glossolalias are still consonant in the disjointing, disjoining of their dissonance. But one will gain no access to Arthur's drawing and portraits if one does not read all its traits according to the, according to the secret grammar of this trait d'union, hyphen, to translate directly from French, of this trait of union and its double. For there is a single one and two hyphens, on the one hand, the one that solders, couples, without other copula, the pair of the two names, uh, father and mother, which Arthur writes so often, especially at the end, as a single word, father, mother, mother, père, mère. Hmm? But also, on the other hand, the hyphen, Arthur, Mumu. What is one doing when one forces one's name? And one, one forges it otherwise, letter by letter, at the bottom of a crucible stuffed to overflowing with vowels to be regulated. The consonants RT, RT, RT in his name are untouchable, immune. Like, moreover, the syllable art, A R T, art doesn't move. As in Momart, in some, art resembles a word that it holds safe, intangible, complete. But an, ins an, an insignificant word, the body of a word emptied of its legitimate meaning. For as soon as the word art <coughs> takes on its common meaning again, as soon as it again becomes a word, one traverses on the way toward an accredited concept, art, the art of fine arts, the art of churches and museums and markets, then the bearer of the name, Arto, is not just content to denounce it, to hurl invective at it. He strikes it with hammer blows. He strikes it to death. The innumerable protests against art and against the work of art would allow us to see Arto as a contemporary of Duchamp, if so many differences did not make this a shocking analogy. Among many other dissimilarities, 
between these two great figures of the century, there would be not a continent, for there is also a good America for Otto, a pre-colonial America, but the United States of America and everything that is colonized, capitalized, canonized, capitanonized, they are in museographic speculation. The blasphemous imprecation, the interjection on appeal, the fired up accusation are aimed sometimes against this, call, this thing called art, sometimes against the work as work of art, sometimes against history as history and holy history, Christian history of art. This war against the history of works of art is conducted, as we've read, in the name of a thinking, or one should say rather, an experience of the face. It is in the name of the face that Arthur declares war, in the name of all the faces that one must learn to see right here, in the name of the face to come of a human visage that has not yet found its face. When Arthur leaves and, and separates himself, when he says, I've moreover definitively broken with art, style or talent in all the drawings one may see here, this assertion is not a calm theoretical or autobiographical, uh, autobiographical declaration. It does not merely relate the event of a break with the art of fine arts, with concerns for beautiful form, for style, for arrangement, for aesthetics, linked to know-how, to skill, to formal training, to the technical experience or experimentation of a talent. It is a declaration of war. The trait, the flaming arrow, the portrait of a vociferation, the drawing of a conjuring cry of malediction, that as all of Arthur's drawings have always done in a certain way, they, all of them are spells, so to speak. Threatens to, they threaten to strike a blow. In truth, they, they strike it already and cast a spell. So it is not just a matter of convic convincing, but of worrying, affecting, transforming the aesthetic's body, changing these transient guests who, having come as visitors or voyeurs into a museum, would claim to be mere spectators. Who to these contemplators and consumers of images? Who to them? says Arthur, who to those who are interested only in art, in beautiful, fictive representation. Quote, I have moreover definitively broken with art, style, or talent in all the drawings one may see here. I say woe to whoever, whoever might consider them as works of art, works of aesthetic simulation of reality. Now, in playing with the spelling of his name, in permuting the vowels, the vocabulary, and thus the voices of the ones and the others, he was drawing while he wrote. He was interweaving the play of the phonemes with the line of the traits between the words, syllables, and things. One could follow the necessity and the force of this gesture, in particular around the syllable ah, ra, r a, r a r, which one finds again in Arto, but also here in dira, et qui dira, et qui aujourd'hui dira quoi, and who today will say what. The turbulence of the proper name agitates only the play of the final vowels, A and O, at the end of the family name. <clears throat> to be sure, the vocal couple, A-O, remains in place, Arto, A-R-T-O, A-R-T-A-U, while the visible spelling of the second syllable with O or A-U, O, becomes one time O, all by itself, without D, another time O, without A, another time T-O-T, -T, taught, precisely so as to designate powder, cannon powder, I suppose, egg or gunpowder, poodle, like fudo, as well as seminal dust, or the germinal pulverization that re-engenders the world from out the primeval volcano, the lava la 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 soup, at the moment of life's creation, then the mutation that gave birth to the unique man, I quote, some powder of Arto, A-R-T-O, some powder of Arto, A-R-A-R-T-O-T, some powder of Arto, A-R-T-O-U-D, to redo the creation. But A-O 
is never inverted into OA. The way Momo seems to be feminized or maternized into MoMA. There is a passage from August 47 where the Gouf Arto, the Arto Gulf, the inner, innate son of God on earth, had no other boast on his lips than to beggar all of made creation. In, op unquote, in opposition to Jesus Christ, of whom he writes, I quote, the only courage he managed to show in his life was to get himself sodomized to death while sodomizing others with very little, uh, others very little except in dreams and from afar, unquote. Now there is another figure of the sexual maladroitness of God, another manner in which to designate the false virginity of Jesus Christianism, the Holy Spirit of the Trinity, the Virgin Father, Mother, Son, as the enemy, the other, the other, or the double to be conjured away, the bad witchcraft associated with the museum. In a text I just read, Werner Hammer, our friend, colleague, demonstrated that for Benjamin as well as for Heidegger, whose ontology, he argues, and I have long suspected in another way, is marked by a disavowed Christianity. One must even speak, he says, of an ontology of the Virgin Mary, of a, what he calls a Christian meteorology. The museum, he argues, remains a thing of the mother. Even in its dematernizing, deconsexualizing, defunctionalizing function, beyond the Benjaminian opposition between ritual cult value and exhibition value, it is heir to what Amar calls a metaphor of the mother. It's metaphor, he said, metaphor. Might one find a supplementary indication of this, I, I ask myself, in the appellation MoMA. The museum that bears it, this name, and par excellence, the museum that sports its initials, would thus be the matriarchal paradigm of a familial genealogy that has become res publica. But can't one say as much of Metropolitan, the other museum in New York, and so on. So uh, Arthur's execration is not only aimed at the museum's witchcraft as Christian maternity and immaculate conception. It is also aimed at the paternity of the father in the pair of the father and mother, le père mère. We must never forget that the blasphemy when he says, I shit on the Christian name. This blasphemy is addressed to the Holy Father in the address to the Pope, address to Pope, that in 46, Arthur wanted to make the preface, the in your face frontispiece of his complete works. Now, before the spiritual couple, before even Mary, the blow is aimed at the immaculate conception that castrated man the male rather than the woman. Around 1943, the unsigned and undated drawing that bears this title, the Immaculate Conception, the next one please, shows once again, the Immaculate Conception, shows once again a phallic cadon, um, equipped this time with uh, testicles in the center, along its edge, what can read, the immaculate, is, is this the right one? Or? <coughs> one can read, <coughs> the immaculate conception was the assassination of the principle of man who is a cannon mounted on wheels. One can also ask oneself, who is coming and what is coming, what is happening to a museum, when it thinks it is housing or even exhibiting Antonin Artaud, and when it allows even the reproduced and virtualized voice of Antonin Artaud to reverberate within it. A terrifying ennoblement of Saint Antonin. The quasi-canonization that lays in wait for him here in this great march of the symbolic market from Paris to New York, from capital to capital, metropole to metropole after the pomp of Pompidou, because there was an exhibition at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. MoMA was perhaps the most formidable ordeal for the specter, for the infant revenant named Antonin Artaud. For let us hang on to one hope. Where there is not the father and the mother, 
the name of the father and the name of the mother. There is the father mother, which Otto takes to be masculine. Le père mère. As if it were still a man or neuter, like a mechanical apparatus. A pre phallic instrument whose indifference would claim to be older and more powerful than sexual difference. Moreover, doesn't he lay claim to it in a very enigmatic fashion, I quote. Well, I am the father-mother, neither father nor mother, neither man nor woman. I have always been there, always been body, always been man. Now, by housing today a picture of Arthur Mumu titled The Execration of the Father-Mother, April 46, MoMA, the museum in New York, has become pregnant in an untimely way with a suicide grenade whose detonator has been generously, but also very ungenerously, and at the time, interested to me. Of course, I didn't want to pull the pin, not right away, because the time of these invisible and unforeseeable explosions must remain anachronistic. A museum still keeps and wears the trace of the blows it receives. It wears them and keeps them itself from them. It beware of them like the truth is wary of the truth. Comme la vérité se garde de la vérité. A coup against the state does become once again a simple coup d'état, the replacement of one state by another. It is nothing more than the substitution of one metropole, one capital, or capital city for another. Like that of the museum and all it carries with it, the auto explosion had been underway for more than a century, as we know. It is a chain reaction whose anniversary we are, we are celebrating today. Otto would be exactly, uh, a few months ago, 100 years old. The drawing, the execration of the father and mother, in other words, of the museum, also bears the title of a magnificent elaborate text that dates from 1946. This text is contemporary with CG, here lies, and Indian culture. One Monday in January 1947, Arto gave the nickname Tete à Tete to a representation of the Vieux Colombier Theater. And the metonymy of this title, Tete à Tete, could orient but also disrupt all the methodological protocols in the world. It is made, badly well made, to set them astray among the operated permutations, the grieving and persecuted perforations the perversions of a polymorphous impulse that with each blow struck forces one to become what one is no more, sometimes there where, there one, there where one was not yet, incorporating one's other at the moment of expelling it, exposing it to the outside by interiorizing it, calling thus in the name of the other and while calling to the other, while interjecting an appeal against oneself and all the way up to God. The mourning, for, the mourning for this God, the incorporating X impulsion, whose coasts, whose coasts and blows, le coup et les coups, are borne by the lightning of these drawings, ruined by the powder of these colors. These no longer pertain to a psychology, unless we conceive a psychology of God, and likewise a psyche of Arto, Momo, whom we would then listen to and call to appear as a witness. I quote Arto. Beyond the psychology of Antonin Arto, there is the psychology of God, the master of masters. And you are not the master. You do not know what has to be done. Well, this psychology happens in my body, me, Antonin Arto, or still earlier. <laughs> Over and above the psychology of Antonin Arto, there is the psychology of another who lives, drinks, eats, sleeps, thinks, eats, sleeps, thinks, and dreams in my body. I do not live in a council of heads. I do not think in a cynical of spirits." Unquote. These heads and spirits want to expel him from his own body right here again at home. Quote, what are you doing here? What are you doing there, Antonin Arto? Yes, what are you doing there? You are bothering us. And finally, get out of your body. It's for us to take your place. You've held it for too long. 
Now, without the experience of these texts, without meditation of these protocols, in one's own body, as well as in the body of the other, using hammer blows, but also the finesse of the most virtual lasers of a thinking to come, without rethinking the immense question of the relations between symptom and truth, folly and fire, art and lightning, food and pudo, without this senseless and incense revolution of self, one cannot commit oneself, body and soul, in the experience of the drawings that are here passing through, hung up like flayed anatomical cutaways on these walls. If one does not run this risk, these risks, then at most one can indulge in some aesthetic tourism and take a walk like a harried connoisseur or a sleepwalker walking collector in the distinguished galleries of a museum that for its part, and for this we must pay tribute to its curators, did manage to expose itself to all these risks. Without causing these dangers, one would accede to neither the alpha nor omega of this event, to the double, double blow of what is held in reserve here, nor even to the question of knowing whether one must begin or end with the alpha or the omega, with the A or the O, especially if one wants to indeed to wonder who is calling whom and how Otto is calling when someone addresses himself with an abrupt apostrophe in his tete-a-tete, -tete, wondering not, I quote, and who today will say what, but, I quote again, well, what do you yourself say? Yes, you, Arto. What do you say, you? You, about all that, me. This doubled Arto was interrogating, interrogating a kind of ghost of himself, already in a text from 1946, titled Interjections. It often happened that he designated or drew Arto as another, and that he treated his, his name like a homonym, apostrophizing himself with brief syllables, according to a cruelly calculated prosody of interjections. He then interposed himself, interjected himself, between himself and himself, so as to appeal desperately from himself to himself, in the sense in which one interjects an appeal after a judgment, which ought not to be the last. To be done, therefore, with judgment, on finir avec le jugement, the, the last judgment. He then evoked the desecration of a tomb, which is what an art of cruelty must be, an anti-art. This body of the old, I quote, body of the old Arto buried, then unburied by himself outside eternities. Again, in face of all this, what remains of the former Arto? Some notes. Elsewhere, while in one notebook from 46, one could find this Oma, Noma, Tapin, one's own primitive onomatopoeia. This onomatopoeia at the, of the head, which I do not slip furt furtively into me, but grab off the last roof. And on the facing page, as if in tete a tete, there was the interpolation, otoro, oto, hetero, apostrophe. Quote, Ato, how so Ato? I told myself never again to talk to myself, never. Unquote. These interjections were dictated at a certain point, as if Arto had not written but received them, which is what prophets do, so they say. The interjections began with glossolalias, a kind of writing in language, as they say the prophets used to speak sometimes. Mal aussi, to me, tapa put, ter ma frotte, et m'ajout pa ma frotte, to be pisarot. It is not it goes on. It is not the crushing of the language, but the hazardous pulverization, powder once again, of the body by ignoramuses. No other orgy of spirits explain the constitution of things. It is the farting of erotic gases, gases, gases from the place where it falls dead. <clears throat> I'm just concluding now. O A O O A are not only vowels, that's fundamental voices, they are not only letters, they are interjections. I've never understood how one can lo love a museum, but also I've never understood how one, can, one could love anything other than the grief-stricken place 
the taking place, the event as event, already of a future memory, the kept trace of double blows, a museum, a library, a sepulcher, a cemetery, a sanctuary, a temple, a church, a pyramid, a erratic archive, a higher archive that gives one as much to hear as to see. What is a museum? Moreover, is it possible forever to, to be ever in a museum that would be only a museum? Is beingness possible? That is, etreté, as Arthur would say. That's another of Arthur's neologism. Etreté, beingness. Beingness in a museum. This question is an abyss that today I have the urge to nickname, quoting again, once again, the Arto Gulf, A-R-T-O. What happens in a museum, in a museum of modern art, when the one vowel is replaced by another, when O is re-vocalized as A in the interjected vociferation of a signature, when Momo becomes Moma or Momart? I have been suffering for some months. I am suffering, yet I take pleasure in an obsession that I vaguely hope to be rid of today, or the day I delivered this lecture for the first time, and the only time. Incessantly, I hear him, Otto, taking it out on me, taking me to court and putting me on trial, accuser and plaintiff, but always drawing, always in the process of drawing his lines. He would be indulging himself right here in what may, may be called action drawing, action in the sense of uh, suing someone, action drawing, against me and against you as well. But for you, it's something else, another story. Incessantly, I project this scene and hear the voice of Arthur. I see nothing, I see no one, but I hear him. He cries out at me. And time shifts, shifts into reverse. As if all my ritual visits to MoMA each time I go to New York, I go to Mama for decades now, as if these ritual visits had been distinct to the somewhat destructed inspection of these gallery places in view of preparing a solemn visitation on a strange day on the occasion of an anniversary. Not the visitation or visible apparition of Antonin Artaud in the temple of the visual arts, not the assumption of the revenant Artaud into the heaven of the new world, or of the great sperm bank of painting, nor the abduction of kidnapping of St. Antonin in this house of worship of modern art, nor rather the return of Arthur Momo, the specter of his voice, whose body, by sacred mission or commission, it would be my job to play at guarding for a moment, the bodyguard right here of a voice from beyond the grave and more alive than ever, as if I had been sent to occupy an impossible place on the American front. Uh, now for lack of time, I, I skip uh, um, a long analysis of, of um, text of Arthur against the United States of, of America, and I because I, I, want, I don't want to keep you too, too, too long here. Um, there is a lot to, 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 to be said about the relationship to, uh, after to, to America, but let, let me skip this. I'm just concluding. So the God of the body of Arthur's voice, which I'm not and do not want to wish to be, but which I've proper, uh, perhaps acted for once, sees nothing but he lends an ear. Within earshot, I hear Arthur in his own tone launching invective cursing, mocking or denouncing, <coughs> blaspheming, swearing, and counter-swearing, conjuring, fulminating, thundering against everything, America, the United States of America, art, the museum, modernity, MoMA, especially MoMA, in which Arto de Momo would have right away identified the malevolent figure of the great expropriator, expropriator and the expert in curiosity of witchcraft, another, remember, museum of magus, sorcerers, and alchemists. Right here today, I imagine the eruption would have been 
volcanic and against a, a conference as well as an exhibition. He would have yelled at us without consideration. He would perhaps have thrown imprecation in our face. After inventing them on the run, unique and inimitable, unreproducible imprecations, cruel glossopoetic interjections. Yet, let us keep these word interjections because it at least passes between our two languages, English and French, in order to say how Arto Momo would have attempted in his turn to prohibit this manifestation, this exposition, this exhibition, and probably this conference too. I will impose on this word interjection a brief stasis to bring to a halt two of its three meanings. First of all, everything that leads it back toward the semantic family of the jet, the jetty, ejaculation, the projection, the projectile of the frenzied subjectile. Even, through, even though interjection has the meaning of a word or a piece of word, namely this syllable or cry that one jettisons so as to shout its exclamation while interrupting the sense of the sentence of the, of the other, even though one may be tempted to term interjections all of Arthur's poems, let us direct the derivation of the word to that which, in the language of the law, designates in the course of an action that is a lawsuit, the procedure of the appeal interjected there where the injury and the injustice risk having been authorized, stabilized, and legitimated by an earlier judgment. One then interjects an appeal to put an end to the misjudged thing with a view towards rising up against the judgment of all judges, those of the court, the churches, the state, the family, or society, against the criterion of all those who take an oath and judge, all those who swear and conjure, who criticize, evaluate, diagnose, doctors, special psychiatrists, art critics, literary critics, moralists, and priests, professors, all secretly warranted by some judgment of God with which the final interjection would like to have done. Through the counter demonstration of a prosecuting defense attorney's final statement and of a counter initiates counter consideration on appeal, Ato Momo, Ato the madman child, Momos the kid, would have protested so as to interrupt, interpose himself, interject himself in appeal against so many indictments. For another himself, whose blows and wounds, whose electrocuted body and barely cauterized scars we are keeping here. It so happens in interjections that Ato replaced, and I'll end with this, he replaced the word ku, C-O-U-P, by the word cor, C-O-R-P-S, body, twice in a row, as if it were more or less the same thing, a synonym and almost a homonym. Elsewhere, he let them double each other and reverberate one another, I quote. Du corps, pas de peur, pas d'impression. Du corps, des coups, des coups de l'individualité. Of the body, no fear, no impression. Of the body, of the blow, of the blows, of the individuality. Now, uh, during the, the, the speech at the MoMA, at that point, we could hear Arthur's voice. Uh, screaming in the, uh, to have done with the judgment of God. Now I had to begin by listening, by playing for you, so you could hear in his own language and according to his voice, the merciless complaints of Antonin Artaud, the, these grievances and these implications, these interjections. First of all, because never before, when finding myself faced with drawings or paintings, although unable to face them, Never have I heard so many voices. Never have I felt myself called, yelled at, touched, provoked, torn apart by this incisive and lacerating acuteness of a broadside of interjections so justly adjusted to their addressee. As if, first of all, they were addressing me so as to instigate my trial. Never, for me at least, will the paper support of a work of art, or visual art, have been perforated 
Never will it have been consumed by the inflamed signature of such, a, such an incontestable voice. Poor Otto, who once one day said, I quote, no, I did not know, I did not know what I would suffer. And now, enough and for all time, you will judge no more. Poor Otto, what is happening to him? He will have been spared nothing, this noble, nothing. Not even the survival of his specter, not even the most equivocal and cruelly ambiguous, the most vain and most anachronistic revenge. Thank you. Open. Uh, he welcomes if there are any questions. He would like to, though it has been a long session, if there is any. Sir, I wonder as to why Arthur did not uh, rebel against the basic factor, against? rebel against the basic factor which binds and bounds all physical objects and physical beings, that is gravity, sir. That perhaps would have been the basic thing because unless you uh, rebel against this, how do you think of freeing yourself from other things? I mean, he, con he contemplated committing suicide and uh, he talked about suicide and his his uh, uh, battle against God, as you said, that means the spirit. But then what about the physical thing with which you are bound to this? Uh, the entire thing is bound to, uh, by gravity, sir. By what? By gravity. The force of gravity. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you help me in understanding the question? No, he said that if he, if he objected to so many things, why didn't he not object to gravity? I think, I think uh, if, if I understand uh, correctly your, your question, I think everything he, he did was objecting to, to not to gravity, it, uh, to natural gravity, but to what became gravity, that is uh, going down, detrimations, for instance. The fact that uh, life, or, uh, uh, yes, life, the true life, was going down, falling down. And he was interpreting the interpretation of this fall, of the, of the fall in, in the religious sense, uh, which is not uh, gravity, which is, which is a, a sort of a, a historical, artificial gravity. But uh, uh, he was doing this in the name of the body proper of the, the terrestrial real gravity, hmm? but it was protesting against uh, the, the religious or the, the metaphysical elevation, spiritualization, which in fact was to him a sort of uh, 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 falling down, uh, a sort of fall, hmm? an at attraction toward um, down, toward the, the what was detrimations in this. That, that was his interpretation of what he called this sexual maladro the sexual maladroishness of God. So he had nothing to object to, to gravity as a, as a purely physical law, but against the uh, exploitation and interpretation of verticality, gravity, falling down uh, on the part of, of Christian religion. In the name of affirmation, it was affirming uh, of a, a reaffirmation of life against death, against that kind of death, which was 
uh, tied to, to Christianity, to this, the, the, the Christian spirit of spiritualization. That is also to, to, to Trinity, to, to the Holy Family, to the Father, Mother, and so on and so forth. Of course, we, if we wanted to uh, uh, answer in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a systematic way your question, we would have to reevaluate, as Otto did, reevaluate the, the, the opposition, opposition between uh, low and high, between uh, uh, what is deep, down, and what is high. Uh, what is the celestial in, in terms of religion, Christian religion, uh, which is high, uh, for Otto is uh, exactly uh, 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 upside down. It, it's exactly what for him is low, and he would like, when he says, when he would like to, to go up, it's against the highness of religion. So he, it's, it, it, he reverses the... He, he, he puts the, 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 the Christian world upside down, so to speak. Yeah. So that's what he does with gravity, uh, with physical gravity, and metaphysical gravity. Uh, I think... Oh, uh, uh, please hold uh, on. They, they, the, will, they will give you Take the mic and please announce your name. Himself. He also puts, uh, say, when child is born, he's upside down. So, what exactly he was working against when he also put the things upside down? Right from the beginning of the life, when the child is born, he's upside down. Mm -hmm. On the earth, he becomes straight, stands. So, yeah. when he was trying to put upside down, so how you tell he, his interaction with God? Uh, he, he, was, he, was, he was claiming constantly that when he was born and when all the Christian uh, children are born, their birth is stolen, is stolen by God. Eh? I was stolen at my, the day I, I was born. Okay? So, uh, even before my um, being alive, my coming in the world, I was the the the, the direction was was inverted or subverted. Okay? Uh, uh, of course, I went down. You can interpret my my birth, the moment of my birth, as a as a falling down, only in a system of religious interpretation. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, you, the, why, why would you say that uh, uh, the coming to life is, is a fall? Coming down, no. It's not coming down. That's an interpretation, it's not coming down. Why, why would, we, would we interpret uh, birth as a, as a fall? If not through a... Uh, already historical, uh, religious, and, and uh, social interpretation. Why would that be a, a, a fall? Why? Could, could go that way, could go that way, it depends. On. <laughs> the birth, in, in, many, in many representations, especially I think in, in Indian culture, the, the the appearance of, of, of a newborn, of the phallus, for instance, it's, it goes up, okay? It, it, the, the birth is not simply the, uh, the, the dejection, the rejection of something down. It may be the, 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 the surrection, the institution, the, the erection, okay? The coming up of, of something new. Okay? So it's always the couple erection, the tumescence, the tumescence which is, a, which is uh, at stake. As Eric Fromm says, we say we fall in love, but actually we should say we rise in love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sir, sir. <laughs> sir. 
why Arto was so much conscious about his audience? <laughs> Pardon me? What, what? Why Arto was so conscious of the audience? Of the audience? About the audience. Well, is that a question about his, his concept of the theater or? No, no. Uh, why he was an anxious to incorporate the gaze of audience as his own gaze? Uh, I'm not sure I can't. Uh, I'm not sure I can understand. Uh, I think. Uh, Perhaps it means that Arthur's concept of the space where the separation should not be yeah. there between the actor and the audience. Uh -huh. They should intermingle. They should act and react. Why? That is his question. Be because as, as, as soon as the, the, the play uh, on the stage is becomes an object, something to be, to be looked at, to be seen, uh, and the audience being separated from, from the, the stage, then uh, something is, 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 is dead already. Something is just objectified and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, transformed into uh, something, uh, something uh, a spectacle, uh, 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 a sort of uh, uh, objective side and it's not theater of cruelty anymore. In the theater of cruelty, there is no spectator. Okay? You have to, to participate in, in, the, in, the, in the play, which not simply improvise, not improvising, but um, according to, the, to a necessity to rules and to a necessity to a prescription. But uh, the, the audience must be part of the, uh, of the, the play and must be involved, so to speak, in the, in, in the play. Otherwise, if there is uh, the limit between the, 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 the audience and the stage, then you have the, the relation subject-object and a, a, um, uh, a sort of uh, motif. Uh, uh, something becomes dead. Yeah? Some, the, the, it's, cruelty means life. Hmm? Cru cruelty means blood and life. As soon as uh, uh, there is this limit, this border between the eye of, of this, the audience, or the, or the ear, or the, the, the senses of the audience, and an object to be seen or to be heard, then uh, this distance produces something like, uh, if not death, at least sickness and, and, and non-life. Uh, his uh, Arthur's imagery and everything that you've said today is very ma masculine, very male. You talk of detumescence and you talk it's of imagery. castration. Uh, uh, does please, it does, please does it mean that the? Could you speak louder and slower? Okay. Uh, Arth uh, Arthur's imagery, as I he heard you describe it, is very masculine. You talk of detumescence and uh, castration. For him, the human predicament, is it a male predicament? Where is the woman in all this? That's a good question. Now, uh, you, remember, you remember I said, I said uh, that despite my, my intense admiration for Arthur, I have a number of reservations, uh, and I'm not happy with, with what he says, okay? Whether in politics or, or in... in Ethics and so on. So I think he's one of the most powerful phallocratic uh, painters and poets and, and playwrights. I would never deny this. It's a hymn to the phallus, uh, uh, no doubt. Now, sometimes some of these terrible uh, phallos, phallocrats, phallocentric uh, poets, because they go to the limit, are more interesting. Are more interesting than than uh, healthy, sane, uh, politically correct, uh, uh, okay? So I, I, I'm interested in, 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 this, in this hyperbolic uh, phallocentrism. Because it is hyperbolic, and once you go to the limit, to the hyperbolic, then you see the limits, the, 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 the hyperbole change its sign, and the most Masculine be becomes an ally to the most feminine. It's often the case with, with Ponge, for instance, with others. 
like that. Uh, but I would not deny that it's not only the themes, but the the forms and the the uh, the rhythm and the the blow. The, the, the th I, I I granted the privilege to the theme of the blow, the coup. That's a it's a phallic blow, no doubt. And the the privilege granted to the to the weapons, to the cannon, to the to the even the act of perforating, the act of in, inscribing, uh, and the act of destroying the support, which is uh, material and, and even modern, modern, maternal and feminine support. Uh, this is terribly, uh, terribly phallic. Uh, I, I thought I thought it was uh, obvious from what I, I said, uh, but uh, you're right. It's uh, now uh, the question. What, what the well, uh, because of this excessive phallocentrism, the woman is everywhere. Uh, yeah. And sometimes it, she signs where, exactly where the man thinks he signs. Okay? That's one of the paradoxes that every, every uh, let's say, uh, every... Uh, consistent consistent uh, feminism should take into account that uh, uh, it's often in the case that uh, the m most phallocentric seems to win or to be to triumph and to uh, to do dominate that it it let the other sign and there, there is also something feminine in Arto. But that. So we shouldn't, I think we should not, you're right, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you, I'm totally in, in agreeing with you, but I think we, uh, once we have said this, we should pay attention to all these uh, inversions constantly at, at work in, in this phallocentric uh, system. Uh, uh, louder, louder and slower, please. Sir? Uh, yeah? not, not now. Can I ask one question on deconstruction? Yours, not related to this topic. May I ask? Yes, of course. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, sir, you in uh, your book, Writing and Difference, define deconstruction as uh, the thing, uh, as uh, it's firstly a destabilization on the move in thinking themselves, but it is not negative. Destabilization is required for progress as well. Uh, in another instance, uh, uh, in a letter to a Japanese friend, you wrote that, uh, I have had to put aside all the traditional philosophical concepts while affirming the necessity of returning to them at least wonder erasure. At least? Sir, at least wonder erasure, E-R-A-S-U-R-E. Sir, uh, from this, can we uh, uh, conclude that the, uh, the concepts which are there in modernism are the, are the margins of the modernism, like uh, scientific knowledge, rationality, ontology, epistemology, has been marginalized in your uh, deconstruction, and those points which are in the center uh, sorry, which are in the margin of the modernity, like madness, fiction, imagination, dream, play a central role in your deconstruction? The, what is the question? I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, uh, Sir, would you agree with me that those issues, those central issues of modernism, like scientific knowledge, rationality, ontology, and epistemology, uh, play a marginal role in your deconstruction and the margin of the modernity like madness, fiction, imagination and dream play a central role in your deconstruction. Would I make it? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, well. If, if, if I understand you correctly, you, you mean that uh, I, re, I reintroduce the margin at the center, and and I, I'm still, I'm still, uh, I could still be a target of my own uh, deconstruction because I, uh, I, 
grant the privilege to a new center. And is that what you, you charge me with? with? Well, it, as, as, you, as you easily imagine, it's, it's, not, it's not so simple. We, uh, we're not playing cards. We're not saying, well, uh, what is marginalized should be placed in the center. Okay. Uh, I always say that it's, uh, the construction doesn't consist in simply putting everything upside down or putting the margin in the center or saying that uh, writing should, should go, should, should be uh, dominant and speech uh, and speech uh, uh, dominated and so on and so forth. It's another, once you, you reverse the order, the hierarchy, then you, you have to go a step further and to propose a new top topology, a new topography uh, where you shouldn't simply find uh, in the center what was previously in the margin and vice versa. It's not, it's not sort of such a, such a, Game. It's 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 a more complicated strategy than that. Yeah. How that takes place? But you Hello. have not completely denied that those issues in modernism, like scientific knowledge, rationality, you have taken into, but uh, not given such importance. Uh, Excuse me. Start. There will be more occasions when Professor Derrida is talking on twenty fourth of January at 2.15 p.m. at Delhi School Auditorium D School. He will be talking on a short history of the lie, state of the lie, lie of the state. And then on Monday, 27th January at 3.30 p.m. in Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and you can carry on further on those questions. I would like to conclude this session because people have come from a long distances, and I would like, uh, there is uh, tea and coffee available outside. You can have more questions amongst yourselves. And uh, meanwhile, I would like to, since it is Professor Darida here, I would like to present a memento of National School of Drama to him on behalf of National School of Drama, which he will accept, I hope. This was the culminating session of homage to Mar to Arto and thanks to Delhi University's Germanic and Roman Studies Department and Eicher Gallery and all those who are concerned with it and everybody who came here and had a long listening for more than three hours. I don't know what rush it can be called. People can't stand for three hours drama but one man's talk, so there must be some rasa in that. Let us think about that, that it exists even today. Thank you.